Naomi Byron, a Victorian legal thriller. Chapter 2, Surrey, House of Corrections. We left immediately for the Surrey House of Corrections, a place I dreaded to revisit. The hansom cab bumped along the jagged cobblestone roads of London. Eventide had swept across, bringing with it dull and grey skies. The gas lamps flickered, casting ghostly reflections. London was a city with superficial glamour, but beneath it lay macabre secrets. Beyond the dark twisting alleys were brothels and opium dens, usually frequented by men in top hats and cloaks. Respectability was a sham. Beggars and tramps crowded the streets. Small children were either begging or sweeping chimneys. The atmosphere was filthy with choking sooty fogs. Poor sanitation made the air heavy and fetid. Diseases such as cholera and typhoid were rampant, and the Thames was clogged with ships from all over the world. I scrutinized the brief and returned it to Martindale. The thought of the Surrey House of Corrections and Susan Taylor filled my heart with grief and trepidation. These feelings only worsened as I continued to look out of the carriage window, seeing poor little children sweeping the filthy streets of London, Little girls and boys, barely ten I would have imagined, their faces covered in grime, their clothes spattered with mud. It seemed they had not bathed in days. It is appalling, I remarked. Martindale, who was engrossed in examining the brief, looked up. What? What is appalling? I pointed at the innocent children. Them, those poor innocent souls, to think of the miseries they have endured, to think of the squalor they have lived in, to think of the hard labor they are subjected to at such a tender age. It is so appalling, Martindale. We come from privileged families, otherwise have you ever wondered where we would have been had we been one of them? Martindale blankly stared at the children. He had been in the profession longer than I. He was accustomed to the poverty, the injustice, the filth, and the depravity prevalent in London. He had been witnessing the cruelties for decades. Yes, it is indeed quite loathsome, Clyde. However, even if we did want to help all these children, you know we couldn't. My wife and I have been giving charity to a workhouse for years. There was a time we had even considered adopting a child, but that was before our daughters came into this world. It's the system that's to blame. I doubt whether you or I could make a difference, not in this life anyway. I was despondent and fell into a silence. Seeing how low-spirited I was, Martindale excitedly exclaimed, Ah, now did you hear of the police raid at the opium den at Limehouse yesterday? Are they not always raiding opium dens in that locality? No, no, not this opium den. It was different. It was used as a brothel. And what is disconcerting is that it was a brothel with, with children. Well, thankfully, the children have now been relocated to Lambeth Orphanage, and the caretakers of that dreadful den of ice are all in prison. Good Lord, how can one be so callous, that too to a child? It makes me sick. Now, now, my egalitarian friend, you are a strong man. You have wrestled with injustice for years. You have already helped a lot of poor souls, Clyde. But let's now focus on this case at hand. What I don't understand is, if you say that she is innocent, who murdered Adler and why? And where's the weapon? Our carriage approached the baleful Surrey House of Corrections, and all the grave memories flooded my mind. But I retained my sangfroid, seeing Martindale's level of enthusiasm. As our carriage entered the high walls of hell, and the gate shut behind us, I saw prisoners in dark, shabby uniforms with brooms and mops cleaning the compound. Martindale commented, Things aren't as bad as they used to be, Clyde, not since some of Elizabeth Fry's reforms were actually implemented. I know. I remember a time when, as a little boy, I would see women prisoners taken through the streets of London in open carts, often in chains. 
They resemble skeletons in a tomb. That is how malnourished they were. They were pelted with rotten food by the people of our beloved city. However, conditions still aren't as they should be, Martindale. We walked towards the entrance of the prison. Mrs. Jacobson, senior warden, a woman I had the displeasure of meeting several times on my visits to Susan Taylor, received us grimly and sternly. <laughs> I see you have returned, Mr. Benedict. I didn't really expect you'd come, she taunted. Why, Mrs. Jacobson? You do know it's my duty. This may not even be the last time I visit this house of horrors, I rebuked. She seemed irked at my response, and Martindale covered his mouth to muffle a chuckle. Mrs. Jacobson cleared her throat. <clears throat> and who are you here for this time, Mr. Benedict? Naomi Byron, I exclaimed. Mrs. Jacobson raised her eyebrows mockingly. I should have known. Please follow me. We followed her inside and climbed several flights of stairs, on each floor seeing what to me were cages. Women weeping behind bars, sounds of clanging gates, Wardens ordering the women to remain silent or they would be sent to solitary confinement. I remembered Susan Taylor's protestations, her pleas and her desperate prayers. No earthly force rescued her. I only hoped God was merciful on her poor soul. As we approached the fourth landing, Mrs. Jacobson, whose cruel countenance and dark attire made her resemble the grim reaper, led us to a secluded cell at the far end of the corridor. It didn't have bars like the other cells, but only a tiny window. She unfastened the lock and permitted us to enter the cell and close the door behind us. I'm not quite sure what to describe first the tiny, shabby, and foul cell, or the beautiful inhabitant who was incarcerated within it. No, I must describe Naomi first. When my eyes first fell on her, my immediate reaction echoed Martindale's description of her. She was beautiful indeed. She had a slender physique and sat uncomfortably on the soiled hammock. To my utmost amazement, she didn't look like a prisoner. Most of the prisoners I had seen had withered skin, not necessarily from age, but from the hard work they had been subjected to, rough hands and rotting teeth. But Naomi's porcelain skin was unblemished, her hair was an exquisite auburn tied in a bun. Her hands were untarnished as if they had never known toil. Had she not worn the grey dress which resembled a uniform of some sort, I would have thought Naomi Byron was a lady from a middle-class family. Naomi, this is Mr. Clyde Benedict, your barrister. Martindale politely introduced me to Naomi. The latter, however, continued sitting on the hammock, swinging gently and looked into my eyes. She had soft, wondrous green eyes. I cleared my throat and spoke. Miss Byron, uh, I am assuming it is Miss and not Mrs. She watched me keenly, then furrowed her brow. Indeed, it is Miss Byron, she replied firmly. Martindale exchanged glances, then suggested he waited outside, whilst I interviewed Naomi, to which she agreed. Miss Byron, can you tell me a little about yourself? Your age, and, for example, where is your family? She looked up to the ceiling and contemplated the question for a moment before replying coldly. I'm 22 years old. I lived with my mother and stepfather in Hackney, but they died a few years ago. I've had no place since then, so I've been working and living at the Lambeth Orphanage, teaching the children there. 
I made notes as Naomi spoke. I am sorry about your parents. If it's all right, would you mind furnishing the salient details about their occupations, if any? She originated from Hackney and worked at an orphanage, but I want you to know a little more about her childhood to understand her better. Well, my mother worked as a maid at a wealthy household at Bond Street, and I didn't really know my real father. I was told he died when I was but an infant. My stepfather never worked. He was a drunk and lived on my mother's earnings. I see. I'm sorry to hear of your parents' demise. Might I ask, how did they die? My stepfather died due to his overindulgence in laudanum, and my mother developed pneumonia. It was when she died I went to Mrs. Parker. She's in charge of the orphanage. She saw potential in me, trained me, and made me a teacher. I continued making notes when Naomi interrupted me. Mrs. Parker can vouch for my character, Mr. Benedict. She was direct. Miss Byron, I'm now going to ask you rather harrowing questions, but you do understand we have to do this as your trial commences soon. May I continue? She nodded solemnly. I will do everything in my power to fight for you, Miss Byron, but you do have to be candid with me. Did you kill Dominic Adler? I was hoping Naomi would fall to or tremble upon the question, yet she remained calm. No, I did not. How did you know him? I didn't know him. Mr. Adler had advertised for a governess in the London Herald some time ago. When I arrived at his chamber at Middle Temple in response to the advertisement, he asked me to visit him at his residence at Richmond on Tuesday, the 17th of October, at 7.30 in the evening. And that is what I did. I continued scribbling. Why did he want to meet you at his residence? He said he was busy working on a case in the Court of Chancery and that he would have more time to discuss matters with me at his residence. I see. And what happened then? Once I reached his home, he started asking me questions about my experience at the orphanage, whether I was qualified enough to teach children as he wanted me to look after his youngest son, Edward, he was seated on his desk chair and I sat on the opposite side. It was whilst we were finalizing the arrangement that someone emerged from behind a bookcase. For a few moments that ensued, Mr. Adler shouted at the stranger, reminded him that he wasn't afraid of his threats. But the man was in such a fit of anger and revenge, it seemed. He brutally bludgeoned him on his head several times. Brutally bludgeoned him, you say. With what? Naomi paused for a moment, attempting to recollect, then spoke. I cannot remember what it was, sir. It seemed like a rock. She had very calmly narrated the facts so far. I was a little curious. Miss Byron, what was your reaction upon seeing all this? Did you try to intervene? Did you fear for your life? Did you at all cry for help? Naomi tossed her head to reveal her immaculately sculpted face, then resumed speaking. I was horrified. I was in shock, and when one is in shock, they are unable to move, to react, to shout. I trembled from head to foot. It seemed as if the man had a personal vendetta against Mr. Adler, and that he had been threatening him for some time. She paused. What did the man look like? Would you describe him for me? I didn't see his face, Mr. Benedict. He was wearing a black hood. He was tall, though, and a little muscular. What then? Well, once he had struck Mr. Adler, he panicked and jumped out of the office window into the garden and ran off, I presume. What became of the rock, the murder weapon, so to speak? Naomi paused momentarily. He took it with him, sir. That's what I remember. And they say that you had a pocket knife on you. Yes, sir. I always keep that with me for my protection. In fact, it was gifted to me by Mrs. Parker. You can confirm the same with her. I will. In fact, when it comes to it, we will perhaps even call Mrs. Parker as our witness so that she can testify to your good character. 
I stopped scribbling and pondered over everything Naomi had said. Miss Byron, was the office window open or was it closed? It was open, Mr. Benedict. That is perhaps how the assailant crept in so easily under the noses of the servants, and that is how he managed to escape. As much as I'd like to believe you, and I have to say I do, I honestly do, some of the facts are puzzling. Such as, she quickly retorted, well, the servants, namely the housekeeper and the valet, didn't see anybody else. The only stranger who entered the house that night was you. Well, Mr. Benedict, if I kill Dominic Adler, where's the murder weapon, eh? What did I do with it? The police searched the premises, didn't they? They didn't find the weapon, as far as I know. I was rather impressed with Naomi's intelligence, but astounded at her boldness. Quite right, Miss Byron. One final question, if I may. Yes. It seems you were content with your life at Mrs. Parker's orphanage. Why then did you wish to seek new employment? Wouldn't you, Mr. Benedict? Who wouldn't want better employment prospects? I have been happy under Mrs. Parker's tutelage. There is no doubt in that. But I don't wish to be a mediocre girl all my life. I want to do something different. I'm good with reading, writing, with arithmetic, with looking after children. The prospect of living at a comfortable home was appealing to me. I paused to contemplate if I had forgotten any pertinent questions. Naomi interrupted my thoughts. Another thing, Mr. Benedict, is that I had absolutely no motive to murder Mr. Adler. As I mentioned, I didn't know him at all. As far as I was concerned, he was to be my future employer. I had nothing to gain from his death. In fact, I had everything to gain from my employment at his family residence, a stable income and decent work. I had rarely seen a bright and bold prisoner such as Naomi. The jury may show her clemency, I thought. It was such a pity, though, that prisoners at the time weren't permitted to present their own testimony in the dock. It would have been to Naomi's benefit, seeing how convincing and eloquent she was with her arguments. As I stood up to leave, Naomi suddenly rose and approached me. She took my hand and said gently, Mr. Martindale has spoken very highly of you. I am innocent. Please don't let me down, sir. For the first time in our entire conversation, Naomi had let her guard down. It was at that moment when I looked into her sea green eyes, I saw fear and sorrow. I reassured her. I'll do whatever I can, Miss Byron. I'll see to it that justice is finally served in this land where injustice has reigned for far too long for prisoners such as you. Another thing, sir, is that I know how expensive your kind is. I'm afraid I cannot afford your fees, she continued to look at me solemnly. I smiled and replied, My kind? Well, I am pleased to assure you I won't accept any compensation from you. Consider this a pro bono arrangement. All I want, Naomi is for the truth to prevail.